Hey, so what you come with Space and Equity? We're all about increasing assets and creating new space. If you like this content, please hit the like button and subscribe. Hit the notification button so you will get notice when we drop something new. Why would you take advice from somebody who's failed? And my response is, oh, did that. So hopefully you wouldn't have to go through that. There is no need to take the same hits that somebody else took. If you can learn from that person, why not? Uh, we still have a lot of experience in this space. Over $100 million in loans and production. I've looked at thousands of deals, done or quarterbacked hundreds of deals for my client, but also experienced through other bankers deals that they had exposure to. So years upon years of exposure to what works and what doesn't work. There's things that generally work and things that generally don't work. And there's no better teacher than an experience. So the experience that we went through is something that uh, was an indelible print in one's mind going forward. Look, if you just keep going, you're going to succeed again. You're going to thrive again. You never think about the steps that you've taken in life. You never stay at one space in one space. So we're going to take it to the next level. We're going to expand. We're going to grow. We're going to learn from it and we'll do things in a manner that we never would have been exposed to had we not experienced the tough times. Bankruptcy does suck, it, but it's a great tool in the U.S. economy to keep, basically to keep entrepreneurs buffered from those falls that inevitably happen. So when you come correct, they can't stop you. We're all about increasing assets and creating new space. If you want a consultation from us, reach out at Space and Equity. Our phone number is 214-251-4786. Again, that's 214-251-4786. Or you can go to our website, spaceequitycorp.com. Click on, we've got consultations here at a discount. We help people. So we've got entrepreneurs that are in development space, looking to buy laundromats or, you know, some people looking to buy a hotel right now. That kind of financing and structuring is not available at most places, but we utilize banking relationships uh, to bridge the gap. So what you'll find is a lot of brokers use technology, which is excellent, and blitz the market to see, okay, I'll give this to like 20 different banks and figure out who can do this. What we do is we leverage relationships. Hey, in 2010, I worked with XYZ Banker. That person is now the president of such and such bank. And I know their bank's appetite is XYZ. So we align that directly. This way, basically, we are operating on the client's behalf to take them into rooms they otherwise wouldn't have direct access to be more efficient. They may just go directly to Wells Fargo, to Chase Bank, and that might not be the best place for them. We believe when you come correct, they can't stop you. But what I'm here today to talk about is wealth transfer up. From a personal standpoint, what has been experienced, wealth transfer up. Whenever you have a cycle like we're in, which is we haven't declared a recession, but we're seeing a lot of evidence that we're in a recessionary environment, what happens is wealth transfers up. What do I mean by that? Well, in 2021, we embarked into invest into a Scooter's Coffee program. To do that, our, our Scooter's Coffee franchise, we purchased some land in Watauga. The, the cost of that dirt was 499000 eventually what we paid for the dirt. Bought that dirt in May of 2022. And then the cost to develop the construction was roughly 700000 So you can say $1.2 million dollars for the development of the land and for the acquisition of the land. Then the equipment associated with that building was well over 200,000, probably closer to 300,000. So it's, it's safe to say that the costs, just the cost of the assets to sell coffee is $1.5 million. In the first calendar year, our rolling 12 months, if you will, well, we didn't even make it to 12 months. We were at 11 and a, and a half months. Actually, uh, let's just call it 11 months. We're at 11 months. We had made $400,000. We'd spent $700,000 to make $400,000. We realized that was not a working model to go forward. It just We were way too far off the mark to make sense of that. So we ceased operations. Well, what we did was when you have a situation like that where you have assets to protect, we filed bankruptcy on the operating company and we filed bankruptcy personally. That protected us against any all the debts that we put in the bankruptcy. So essentially... It was the contingent debts of the businesses 
and some personal liabilities. And to make it clear, we had, when we started this organization, when we started these operations, we had $5,000 in credit card debt. By the time we filed bankruptcy, we had 170,000 in credit card debt. The Now that credit card debt was not directly associated with the Scooters franchise, but it existed because we were pouring money that we otherwise would have had available for paying those credit cards off into the credit card, into the operations. So that was an indirect hit, if you will. We had rental properties that we were pouring money, pulling money out of that would have otherwise had no issues. That was another indirect hit. So we protected our home, we protected and we protected our retirement accounts. But what we lost was three rental properties, four rental properties that we sold and the operations itself, the real estate on the operations and about $700,000 in cash that came from money saved, money's converted from retirement accounts on my end to invest in these operations. And then of that, about 100,000 are just loans that we took out to support the business because at the time we had good enough credit history to support that. Well, I say, why am I talking about wealth transferring up? Here's why. For the building alone and the opera, it was 1.5 million investment, just the cash component of it. We lost $300,000 in operations. We filed bankruptcy. We, at the time, we had attempted to sell the property from as early as February, 2023, up until it was foreclosed in June of 2024, but did not get the sale. The reason, one of the reasons we didn't get the sale was based on the competition in the area and the lack of performance on the store, it didn't make sense for an investor to buy the real estate, get a return on the investment by the rents we paid on the real estate when the operations weren't doing as well. I will note, there's been real estate sold in the same asset category with less revenue than ours, but I'll let you think about why that could be the case and sold on a seven cap, meaning if a seven cap is, is this, you sell, you buy a building for 1.5 million and you for every year you get 7% return on the cash required to buy it. So that might be, and I think that's 80 some thousand in annual rents going towards that capitalization rate. So by the time you get to the number of years it takes to do that, which is roughly a little over 15 years, you will return all the cash investment. So at a 7% rate per year per annum. Anyways, let's get back to the real estate, the coffee shop real estate and why stuff goes up. And then we're gonna talk about the rental cop properties that we lost. All right, so on the coffee shop, which we were protect the business, the, the owner of the real estate, Kanaja Beans Real Estate Holding wasn't protected. But the guarantors, myself, my wife, and my business partner, we were protected in, in bankruptcy court, right? So that they can't go back to us, but they can sue the that business for anything that's left. The building sold in foreclosure for seven, roughly 717000 Now, under, what do you mean wealth goes up? Because the individual, the corporation that bought it for 717000 I contend, had more wealth than me. I paid 1.5 for it to work. So they basically bought it for just shy of 50 cents on the dollar. They bought the asset for 50 cents of what it costs me to buy it and build it out. And now they have a full, they have an asset. They're not going to use it as for scooters, coffee. I don't even know what they're going to use it for, but let's say there's a outfit called Swig and, and they lease it to Swig. They have all the stuff they need already. The building's ready to go. There may be some equipment in, that needs to be changed out for, for the most part for 717000 and call it another 100000 for finish out. Let's make it even 820000 They're able to. So that 820000 if the revenue is 400000 which it should be more over time, but that is much easier, exhaust the cost or the expenses associated than $1.5 million that's only doing $400,000 a year. And there's more costs associated with that based on the other soft cost expenses. We were over $2 million in expenses into the operations. Anyways, not only did that wealth go up, as I contend, the person, the entity, the group that paid 717000 roughly for what we paid $1.5 million for, got it for less than $0.50 cents on the dollar. And they had more access to capital than us, more cash in general. What do, what do I mean by that? 
Well, the bank that we were dealing with refused to accept a a contract for nine hundred thousand by a third party because, and this is a fair reason to refuse it. A nine hundred thousand dollar contract is not the same as cash. So even though in the contract the individual said that they were going to pay cash for it, they're going to buy it within fourteen days. Anything can go wrong until the wire is sent. So that the bank said, "No, we don't want that." However, they sold it in foreclosure for a lot less. Why would they do that? Well, banks are not designed to hold real estate like that. They don't want to have the carrying costs of having it. They have a there's an attorney that they're paying for. They just want that cost eliminated. But also, there are groups, corporations, individuals that partner with bank on their real estate owned assets. So a bank, we want to own paper. We loan as a banker, we loan you money. We put a deed of trust on the asset if it's a real estate asset. And in the event that you don't pay us, we take it back, but we'd rather you pay us, pay the bank payments. Once we own the real estate, it's a cost that has to be liquidated fast. How do you liquidate it fast? With partners who build up a lot of cash, have a lot of cash to buy these things for pennies on dollars, get it off your books. So I'm like, why would the bank turn down a $900,000 cash offer only to sell it in foreclosure for 700 and let's say at least $180,000 less than they would have got if they, the reason is if that partner, when you sell it for foreclosure, you got to sell it through the county, people have to bid on it. But if they already have somebody that knows that is ready to go, knows a profit, property is going to go on the market in XYZ days, they're prepared to buy it unless somebody else has done some research on that property and has the cash ready to go when it's auctioned at the county steps. So I contend, I don't know for a fact, I just know as a 20 year banker, this is most likely what happened. Somebody who knows the bank that I was dealing with and has bought real estate from them before, real estate owned property through this process and buys in volume or in bulk, it makes sense for them to maintain that relationship to say, hey, we're gonna foreclose on this property at this date, be ready cash. You may get outbid, if somebody else has a specific, but you kind of have first right of refusal by the information. And if I'm going to do this with you 10, 20, 100 times on in, now I don't want to foreclose on that many properties, but if the relationship over time is going to yield that much, it then makes sense to sell it to you for 717000 even though I could have sold it potentially for 900000 and recouped more of my money. See? And... When I say wealth goes up, the individual, the group who bought that definitely probably had more money than my group who could not sustain those type of losses anymore and had to shutter the business, file bankruptcy for protection. In this season, we're going to see billions, if not trillions of dollars of wealth transfer up. Entrepreneurs, you know, thousandaires, millionaires are going to lose their assets to billionaires. That's how this thing works in these types of cycles. I'm not, it's, I'm not saying that it's a fault of anybody, but what I'm saying is there's no way somebody with less resources than I bought that asset because they would have had to have cash to buy it. They would have access to cash. They would have, to, and maybe they got the cash through a line of credit, but if they got a line of credit to make that type of transaction, they got cash and they got more cash than us. I'm saying it's most likely not a teacher that bought that in foreclosure. It's not a teacher. It's not a, a second year engineer, most likely that bought that. Somebody with access to wealth or a wealth team, a lot of capital bought that. And they're buying stuff in bulk in this type of market for 50 cents on the dollar like this transaction. Because the other thing they've got to look at is that what do I do on the backside? This failed as a coffee shop, maybe because the operators weren't good enough, maybe because there was too much competition in the area. But what do I do on the backside? Whoever bought it for 717000 has figured something that makes sense. And the way the real estate is structured, it's got to be something like a coffee shop or this swig concepts that is going to make the most sense. Again, wealth transferring up. Now, the challenge for us is it took us 20 years to build up that $700,000 in cash savings and other pieces of real estate. In addition to losing the Scooters Coffee site, lesson learned. We also, in the bankruptcy protection, what we could not protect is our rental properties. We had three rental properties with the same bank, one in Houston. It sold for $212,000 in foreclosure. We had a contract that was de declined for $270,000.
again, that you're like, why would they do that? Because that volume relationship makes more sense to, to persist. That speed makes more sense to persist than taking a chance on this cash contract. What if it doesn't come through? So it's 212, they were made whole on their mortgage. There was balance that was owed was 188,000. So they were made whole on where they wanted to be made whole. There was a tax loan because we were out of capital. So those folks, usually a tax lien actually goes in front of anything else. So those folks should be made whole, but the bank didn't reach out. They didn't care about the people who gave us a tax loan, but that liability doesn't go away. It will transfer to the next owner if they weren't made whole. So the people that we had the tax loan to when we were trying to make everything work, they called me. I said, I don't have the property anymore. They weren't too worried because they know that we still have a first lien position and the new owner is going to have to pay us. He bought the asset. She bought the asset. It is what it is. Wealth going up. Somebody with more cash than us and able to do a cash transaction or a what we call a pseudo cash transaction. What do you mean a pseudo cash? You can have cash that you already have or access to capital liquidity available through a line of credit, through a loan of some capacity where maybe your lenders is private equity. Because you got to give a return on the investment and private equity has given you the capital. What you didn't do is go and get that financed to buy it for 212000 You had the cash ready to go at the auction. This money will be wired in two business days. You already had some money put down before you even get to bid for it. So let's say in order to bid the seed money, I used to do this when I was in my 20s and the seed money was small, like $1,000 on some of these tax foreclosures. But in this transaction, let's say it was a $5,000 seed money. So to be have a seat at the table, you put down $5,000 that's that is not refundable in the event that you win the bid. If you lose the bid, they're going to give you your money back. If you win the bid and you don't close, you're going to lose that $5,000. So that group or the entity that bought the house in Houston, our rental house in Houston, they put down $5,000. They win the bid then they have to come up with the balance. In this case, 212. So the balance they would have owed is 207,000. And within business days, maybe three to five business days that the, the balance has to be wired. I know it's wired because I was in contact with the tenant um, to let them know that, hey, you need to contact this person now and, and negotiate your lease. That group had more money or resources than we did wealth going up. And we had a duplex in Fort Worth that also we had a potential contract on that was declined and the property foreclosed for less. I think we had a contract for 245 for each. Now, mind you, we paid 295 for each of those units in Fort Worth, put about $60,000 $60, down on each. So we got a loan, it's 2000, I can't do math anymore, about 235 original loan balances. So that 245 per unit was de was declined by the bank. We're not interested. They foreclose and they sell it for less than that 235 that we are 245 that that we offered per, per unit through a third party. Again, the surety of the close through foreclosure and the sale and the liquidation through foreclosure is more attractive to the bank than a few more thousand dollars because they don't want this asset hanging around. And in order for it to be efficient and attractive for the bank to go that route, take less than they could potentially take, is to have groups and individuals with wherewithal buy in bulk, essentially. So you have people that their business, part of their business model is, I'm going to just contact a bunch of banks throughout the country and buy their real estate owned assets. The bank's are designed to own paper and not real estate, but in the event they have to take the real estate back, these people are saying, hey, we're gonna buy it and take it off your hands. So you don't have all those additional expenses. We experienced directly wealth transfer up. So what we lost in wealth wise and between the cash we lost and the value of the real estate over time was over $3 million. The way it was described in our bankruptcy discharge, it's about like $3.2 million worth of assets gone. Three rental properties directly, the scooters real estate directly, and then the four pieces of real estate that we owned and sold for the capital injection needed in the project also gone. All of that wealth transferred up. So it was cheaper, way cheaper for the people to buy it, but it had to be people with wherewithal to buy it. It wasn't your teacher. It wasn't your local nurse 
who bought that through foreclosure was wealth groups, probably people tied to private equity or people with wherewithal more expensive than what we built over 20 years. So it's different lesson, different time, but no, during these phases in our society, wealth transfers up the people with more, get even more in these scenarios. That's the way the game is played. We lost, we're gonna learn from it and we're gonna play again, but way more efficiently. We don't have the resources of credit that we had historically, always had good credit, that's not an option anymore. So now we have to be way more efficient as we take on our projects. But I really just wanted to share how the game works and where wealth transfers up, how banks partner with groups with wherewithal to liquidate in an expedient manner, but you have to have wherewithal and cash to do it. You can call the bank. You can call and say, I'd like to get a, on your list of bank owned properties. But honestly, if you don't have a bunch of cash ready to go, you're not going to get that far based on the model, the business model. Hey, it's based on equity. When you come correct, they can't stop you. We've learned, we've come, we've over-indexed on mistakes and lessons learned. Now the job is to learn effectively from those lessons. Come correct, they can't stop you.